Good day, everyone, and welcome to our class, Marine Zoology 2. First lecture that I have will be on the Intro to Marine Biodiversity, Taxonomy, and Phylogeny. After so many years, the number of organisms alive on Earth is still unknown. So there's a few estimates of around 50 million. But actually, the most catalog and described one described species or estimates for about 1.2 million to 1.9 million as of today. And large proportion of the Earth's total species count is mostly living in marine waters, or yung mga marine creatures. So an estimated of about 80% of these marine species have not yet been identified. Mas marami pang nakaabot ng moon kaysa nakapunta sa ilalim ng dagat. So throughout the history, Humankind has sought order in the diversity of life. Okay? So they made various schemes. They've been used to organize and group species using some type of taxonomy because they wanted to, to organize to make sure that their uh, identified species were actually organized in a, in a form of cabinets. <laughs> That's why they, they tried to use it, the groupings this very various species of animals, both smaller ones and the most bigger ones, as well as the mga microscopic ones. But with, with, uh, with the wide acceptance of the first evolutionary theory culminating in the publication on the origin of species by means of natural selection by Charles Darwin in 1859. Siya yung unang nagpublicize ng uh, yung origin of species and then new classification as well. So taxonomies began to be constructed grouping of organisms not actually based on ancestral relationships. So meaning uh bibigyan ka ng ancestral relationships yung face mo, yung uh, morphological features mo is actually inherited from the first organisms that being lived that lived before you. So ganun yung kanila, ganun yung theory ng natural selection. And we are shaped by the environment that we actually live in. That's true. And then from that, uh, yun yung first na theory that's been given by Charles Darwin. So taxonomies began to be constructed group of organisms based upon the ancestral relationships. But in practice, determining evolutionary ancestral relatedness is very difficult even for a very good day. So, ang hirap na mag-identify mag ng mga species kahit magkapare-pareho pa. So, what is phylogeny? Phylogeny of an organism's actual ancestral history as well as the science of reconstructing evolutionary histories. So, one of the example of this one, one of the major goals of the studies of phylogeny is mainly came from the studying of fossils, comparative anatomy, Morphology, yung mga shapes nila. Physiology, the functions of their tissues and other organs. Molecular biology, genomes or the genetic composition of that one. And even the biogeography. Kahit magkapareho sila pero magkaiba yung lugar nila, they could still be, uh, they could still have the distinction between them. And it's to use the data collected to construct what we call this phylogeny. So isang example ng phylogeny ay this one is an example of phylogeny of the chordata. Pero saan mo ba makita yung chordata dito? Diba makita mo sa pinakahuli? Okay. As for our marine zoology one, we've discussed it from the ancestral colonial to the first invertebrates, kaling sa parazoans or yung living without tissue. And then the yumatozoans, yung first nito is the what? Anong una nito? Yung mga sponges. Okay followed by the bilateria or bilateral symmetry na may merong triploblastic and then those with the cellulates yung mga no body cavity we discussed this a, a while ago in during our con during our uh, marine zoology one and the body the starting of the body cavities or yung mga cellulates mabas dito yung cellulates then nagputa tayo sa protostomia we also have this yung mga ectoprocta, meron tayo dito 
prosobranchia, and a lot of others. Pero yung ididiskasan natin is only coming from this part here. Ito. Yung sa chordata. So, all members are part of the celomate deuterostemia. Okay? Although the developmental pattern is highly modified in some, this phylum contains most of the animals familiar to us. Ito. From fish, reptiles, birds, mammals. Okay? And saka yung mga marine birds, kasali doon. Okay? Contains much more of the similar forms. It contains an array of organisms that share common anatomical and morphological characteristics and are important in the ecosystem as food chain components as well as keystone species as like mga shark. And yeah, yun yung, nila, yun yung isang example ng phylogeny. This one is more uh, generalized. Until the phylum core data, ay meron din yan siyang kanyang phylogeny. Classification is an aid in organizing information about all known species, as well as adding new species when they are discovered, is how to use the standardized system for assigning names or for grouping name of organisms sharing common ancestors. So ito yung ginagamit nila when they make the phylogeny. They standardize the, the system itself by uh, combining all the traits na meron sila, both the genomic traits, mga morphological traits, physiological traits, yun, kasalin siya sa paggawa ng classifications. Now, the science is a community of activity dito sa atin. And while individuals may develop procedures, various processes, as well as methodologies, the general value elevates if the community of scientists adapts them. Yun yung isa sa mga, pani, sa mga issues about this. If they don't agree with the kind of classification and systems in classifying those animals or group of organisms, so this, the, the scheme or the, the type of process in classifying those animals will not be accepted by the scientific community. So that's why there's a lot of uh, debate among them, especially sa pag-classify ng mga different animals and plants. So, accordingly, the general methods adopted by biologists for classification of species is first give each unique species name consisting of two parts. Ito na yung sinasabi natin na yung scientific name na genus and species. Okay. So, the first name is always capitalized. And is the generic or tinatawag natin genus name. Well, the second one is the specific epithet and it's only capitalized if it is derived from the proper noun, such as the person's name or a name of geographic feature. So, example of this one are uh, yung mga names na ito or yung tinatawag natin scientific name is actually both names are italicized or underlined. Okay, so ito yung kwa natin na Ito yung dapat tandaan natin. Pag mag-write tayo ng kuan, uh, binomial, uh, nomenclature or yung scientific name, for example, it should be capitalized yung first na kuan, first na letter of this one, and then for the genus, and then for the species would be a small letter. And it should be italicized or kung hindi naman italicized, it should be underlined. Okay? Remember that one. Carlos Linnaeus, a Swede scientist, is also known as the father of classification or the father of taxonomy. He was first developed his system of classification of animals and plants in 1758. Biologists until now are still generally accept the method they use or he used in modern as well as in modified form. Linnaeus was the first one to introduce many of the classification categories that are actually being used until today. This includes your know, kingdom, phylum, division, class, order, family, genus, as well as species. The most common one of the modern categories mainly includes the domain. The name domain bacteria, archaea, as well as the domain eukarya. Now, these, sequ these sequence are actually most started with the most general category, just like the domain and the kingdom and then containing large number of organisms to a most specific containing single kind of organisms, ito yung genus and species. The classification of each is 
theoretical study as well as underlying principles is now what we call yung term na tinatawag natin na taxonomy. And it began with Carlos Linnaeus. Systematics, on the other hand, is the study of relationships in an attempt to understand its phylogenies. Now, taxonomic categories such as phylum and family should not be confused with taxa or taxon singular such as an animalia. Okay, kasi when you put this one into perspective, ang animalia or the kingdom animalia compared with the kingdom plantae is different in terms of one, pwede doon sa cellular structure nila, pwede sa kanilang adaptation, pwede sa kanilang morphological functions. Okay? So, the kingdom name containing animals like Delphinidae is the fam well, the family under this example is the Delphinidae or the family name containing those dolphins. Now, each of these taxon is collectively known as taxa. Okay, yun yung ibig sabihin nun. So with this, with our understanding of phylogenies changes, so do as the classification categories and methodologies. So for example, yung paggamit ng category ng domain was actually added as an evidence accumulated that kingdom alone is insufficient to categorize them. So, ano bang nangyari? So, meron, tat meron tatlo na ngayon. Meron tayong kingdom, ah, meron tayong domain eukarya, which is the complex one. We also have the domain uh, archaea, at saka yung, that, that means yung mga kanya mga archaic bacteria. Well, the other one is the domain bacteria, which is commonly found, uh, which is commonly found sa mga surroundings natin. Okay? Mga extremophiles naman yung mga archaic bacteria. So here's an example of a more modern one of classification, which is the domain. So ang binigay nito is yung domain bacteria, this one here on the left side. Ang right side naman is the domain archaea, yung mga extremophiles. While yung mga complex form of animals belong to domain eukarya. So, dito na yung mga eukarya dito from plants and animals itself, yung mga complex form, while bacteria as well as the extremophiles, where is another domain na yan siya ng domain of classification. So, accordingly, all species are a composite of anatomical, morphological, physiological, as well as molecular characteristics, mainly inherited from their distant ancestors or those ancestors that evolved into another species. Okay? So, meron silang kanyan. So, kung depende kasi sa environment kung saan sila na na-confine during the time. So, that's why yung mga composite or inherited na mga kanila na mga features were actually being given, uh, were actually being seen both anatomical, morphological, as well as yung molecular characteristics. Now, those characteristics inherited from the past ancestors, tinatawag silang ancestral characteristics or simply, uh, simply show for more face. They simply show for more face. And those that not shown by ancestor, which mainly evolved from the environment that they have, and which are more recently, they are called as derived characteristics. While organisms that share derived characters naman, or uh, that shared uh, the right characters mainly came from the environment itself, tinatawag silang clade, and the characters they share are what you call shared the right characters or synapomorphies. Okay? So, like yung pag-develop pag ng wings, pag-develop ng limbs, okay? So, yun yung example ng mga synapomorphies. To give you more details and insights, let's taxonomy. Let's watch this video it's the science of classifying living things. Basis. That sounds exciting. Today, we'll basically be learning the Dewey Decimal System of Evolution. It's like filing. You must be on the edge of your seat. Okay, shut up. When it comes down to it, 
This science doesn't just categorize organisms. When you look a little deeper, you realize it's telling the story of all life on Earth. And it's a pretty good story. <laughs> Every living thing on this planet is related to every other living thing. If you go far enough back, we all have a common ancestor. An organism that both you and I are descended from, or something that a starfish and a blue whale are both descended from, or even weirder, that an oak tree and a salmon are both descended from. That organism lived. It lived very long ago, but it was here. And I dig that. The trick of taxonomy is basically figuring out where all those branches of the evolutionary tree are and finding some convenient labels to help us understand all of these remarkable interrelationships. Let's be clear though, taxonomy isn't about describing life in all of its ridiculous detail. It's mostly about helping humans understand it because it's way too complicated without structure. To get that structure, biologists use the taxonomic system to classify all the organisms on the earth it's sometimes called the phylogenetic tree, or the tree of life, and it illustrates the evolutionary relationships between all living species. So there are about two million known species, but there could be anywhere from five million to a hundred million species. Scientists really have no freaking idea. New species keep getting discovered all the time, and the more organisms we have to keep track of, the more complex the phylogenetic tree becomes. So there's not always a consensus about how to classify this stuff. There's a lot of gray area in the natural world. Actually, let me rephrase that. The natural world is one giant gray area. Sometimes it's just hard to know where to put a certain group of organisms, and eventually the group gets so big the classification system has to be messed with to make room for it. So the system isn't perfect, but it's good enough that we've been using it for around 250 years. What's that? Do you smell a biography coming on? Carl Linnaeus was a Swede, born in 1707, and early in his career as a botanist, he realized that the botanical nomenclature of 18th century Europe was, well, just crap. For instance, in his day, the formal name of a tomato plant was Solanum caule enerme herbaceo folis penatis incisus racemus simplicibus. Linnaeus actually said, once I shudder at the sight of most botanical names given by modern authorities. Not only did the sloppiness bother him, he saw a whole sugar storm blowing in, because new plants were still being discovered in Europe, but that was nothing compared to the crazy stuff that was coming from the New World. Linnaeus saw that pretty soon naming conventions were just gonna collapse under all these new things to name, and then what? So Linnaeus famously started off by naming himself. He came from a peasant family, and at that time surnames were just for rich people. So when Carl went to college, they asked him for his surname, and he just made one up, Linnaeus, after the linden trees that grew on his family's homestead. Linnaeus got a medical degree and became a professor at Uppsala University, where he devoted himself to the study of nomenclature. He had his students go to places and bring back specimens for him to study and categorize. The method he eventually adopted was based on morphology, or physical form and structure. This wasn't necessarily a new idea. Back then, people grouped organisms by analogous or homoplastic traits, structures that appear similar, but actually come from completely independent origins. By this definition, birds would be more closely related to butterflies than to reptiles, because both birds and butterflies can fly. But Linnaeus had a good mind for this stuff, and turned out to have a real knack for choosing actual homologous traits for his classification system. Traits that stem from a common evolutionary ancestor. Linnaeus, of course, didn't know jack about evolution. Darwin wouldn't come around for another hundred plus years, but he intuited that some traits were more important than others. For instance, he was struck by the fact that reproductive apparatus seemed to be a good way of classifying plants. He also caused a bit of a scandal by classifying class mammalia based on the female abilities to produce milk from their nipples, because apparently that was pretty racy stuff back then. In his lifetime, Linnaeus cataloged roughly 7,700 plants and 4,400 animals. He published his classifications in a catalog called Systema Naturae, which by the time he wrote its 12th edition, was 2,300 pages long. In the meantime, Linnaeus actually adopted a personal motto, God created, Linnaeus organized. Although taxonomy has come a long way since Linnaeus, we still use a bunch of the conventions that he invented. 
For instance, we still arrange things into taxa, or groups of organisms, and we still use the same taxa as Linnaeus. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. We also still use Linnaeus's convention of binomial nomenclature, using a unique two-part name for every species, the genus and its species name. In Latin, or sort of Latin-ish. This practice actually started back in the Middle Ages, when educated people were expected to know Latin. We know a lot less Latin now, but we know a lot more about evolution, which Linnaeus didn't. And we have technologies like genetic testing to classify relationships between organisms, and yet we still use Linnaeus's morphology-based system because genetic evidence generally agrees with classifications that are made based on structure and form. However, because there was a lot of life that Linnaeus had no idea about, we had to stick a new taxa above Linnaeus's kingdom. We call it domain, and it's as broad as you can get. The domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The bacteria and the archaea are prokaryotes, meaning that their genetic material goes commando, with no nucleus to enclose it, while the eukarya make up all of the life forms with a nucleus, and include pretty much all of the life that you think of as life, and quite a lot of the life that you don't think about at all. It might seem like since all macroscopic life only gets one domain, it's kind of silly to give prokaryotes two. And for a long time we didn't. We didn't divide them up into different domains, they hung out together in a single domain called Monera. But it later became clear that bacteria, which live pretty much everywhere on Earth, including inside of you and deep in the Earth's crust, and archaea, which are even more hardy than bacteria, have distinct evolutionary histories. Archaea being more closely related to eukaryotes, and yes, thus me and you, they have totally different cell membranes, and the enzymes that they use to make RNA, their RNA polymerase, is much more like ours. Under the domain eukarya, which is by far the most interesting and even occasionally adorable domain, we have kingdoms Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. Now scientists have settled on these four, for now. But these are categories that are a human creation, but there are good reasons for that human creation. The unscientific truth is that we looked at life and divided it up based on what we saw. So we were like, well, protists are single-celled organisms, so they're very different from the rest of the domain. And plants get their energy from the sun, and fungi look and act very different from plants and animals, and, you know, we already know what animals are, so they have to get their own kingdom. And those scientists are sometimes loath to admit it, that system of just looking and dividing things up actually worked pretty well for us. Not perfectly, but pretty well. But there's a reason why this worked so well. Evolutionarily, there are actual categories. Each of these kingdoms is a huge branch in the tree of life. At each branch, an evolutionary change occurred that was so massively helpful that it spawned a vast diversity of descendants. Plants, or plantae, are the autotrophs of the domain eukarya. Autotrophs meaning that they can feed themselves through photosynthesis, of course. Their cellulose-based cell walls and chloroplasts giving them a distinct difference from all other multicellular life. There are two other sorts of trophs. There's the heterotrophs, which get their energy by eating other organisms, and the chemotrophs, which are weird and crazy and only show up in bacteria and archaea, and they get their energy from chemicals. Now the kingdom Protista is weird because it contains both autotrophs and heterotrophs. Some protists can photosynthesize while others eat living things. Protists are basically a bunch of weird eukaryotic single-celled organisms that may or may not be evolutionarily related to each other. Scientists are still trying to figure it out. Some are plant-like, like algae, some are more animal-like, like amoebas, and some are fungus-like, like slime molds. Protists are one of those gray areas I was telling you about, so don't be surprised if by the time you're teaching this to your biology students, there are more than four kingdoms in eukarya. Fungi, which are, you know, the funguses. They include mushrooms and smuts and puffballs and truffles and molds and yeasts, and they're pretty cool because they have cell walls like plants, but instead of being made of cellulose, they're made of another carbohydrate called chitin, which is also what the beak of a giant squid is made of, or the exoskeleton of a beetle. Because fungi are heterotrophs, like animals, they have these sort of digestive enzymes that break down their food and get reabsorbed. But they can't move, so they don't require a stomach for digestion, they just grow on top of whatever it is they're digesting, and digest it right where it is. Just super convenient. And finally, we have Kingdom Animalia, which is the lovely kingdom that we find ourselves and 100% of adorable organisms in. Animals are multicellular, always. We are heterotrophic, so we spend a lot of time hunting down food because we can't make it ourselves. And almost all of us can move, at least during some stage of our life cycle. And most of us develop either two or three germ layers during embryonic development. Wait for it. 
unless you're a sponge. So like I said, we use this taxonomic system to describe the common ancestry and evolutionary history of an organism. Looking at the phylogenetic tree, you can tell that humans are more closely related to mice than we are to fish, and more closely related to fish than we are to fruit flies. So how about we pick an organism and we follow it all the way through the taxa, from kingdom to species, just to see how it works. I know. Let's pick this kitty. Because I know she'd like it. Right, cat? So kitties have cells that have nuclei and membrane-surrounded organelles, and they're multicellular and heterotrophic and have three germ layers of cells when they're embryos, so they're in the kingdom Animalia. And they have a spinal cord running down their backs, protected by vertebra and discs in between them, and they have a tail that doesn't have a butthole at the end of it, like a worm, which I'm really glad about. <laughs> and that puts her in the phylum Chordata. Kitty clearly does not like this, so I'm going to put her down now. And the kitty lactates. Uh, it gives birth to young like a cow instead of laying eggs like a chicken. And they have fur and three special tiny bones in their ears that only mammals have. So they're in the class Mammalia. So she's more closely related to cow than to chicken. Good to know. And like a bunch of other placental mammals that eat meat like weasels, the mustelids, and dogs, the canines, kitties are in the order Carnivora. And they're in the cat family, Felidae, whose members have lithe bodies and roundish heads, and except for cheetahs, retractable claws. And they're littler than tigers and panthers, which puts them in the genus Felis. And then at the level of the species, the descriptions get pretty dang detailed, so let's just say that you know what a cat is, so the species name is Catus. And look at that! Felis Catus. No, gee, I could have that whole thing cross stitched onto a pillow for you to sleep on. No, we don't. Thank you for watching our taxidermy issue. No, I mean taxonomy episode of Crash Course Biology. We hope that you learned something. Thanks to everybody who helped put this episode together. If you have any questions for us, please leave them on Facebook or Twitter in the comments below, and we will get to them hopefully very quickly. Uh, we'll see you next time.